Hello everyone, welcome back. So now let's actually talk about the max shear flow in a thin walled flange. Now I mentioned this last time, so I guess I was a little bit early here, but hopefully you read the book so you weren't too confused. Um, that shear flow, well it starts at zero at all the edges. And it reaches a maximum, like in this section right here, it's actually increasing linearly. And the reason for that is because our Q is increasing linearly. Um, sorry, Q is being first moment varia. It's really terrible when they use the same letters for everything. <laughs> So the max shear flow in the flange and the web is going to increase at, or is going to occur at the center of either section. Now you might be wondering, well, why is this? Well, let's think about it. Our shear stress and therefore our shear flow has to be zero at any free end. If it's not, this isn't a free end and it's going to have to pop off. Woo! No, we don't want that. We want our things to stay stable. And so the shear stress has to be zero. But obviously there is shear stress there. We're applying a force. There's got to be some shear stress. So what that means is that yes, it's zero, but it's going to increase. It's going to increase as we go towards the point that the shear stress is actually acting through, which is going to be our shear center right here because this is nice and symmetric, which will be at the centroid. Um, and so at that point, we have our max shear flow and therefore our max shear stress happening right there at the middle of our beam. So shear flow is going to increase from the tips. Another reason for that name shear flow is because if you look right here, what you see is that they're opposite each other. And you think, okay, well, they're going to add, well, that's a positive plus a negative. That's just going to equal zero. But it doesn't because all of that shear flow, all that shear stress then flows into this next member. It's one of the reasons that shear flow makes sense is because it's using that term. It's helping us see that, yes, these are, that's negative, that's positive. However, they are going to be moving both of them into this surface. Um, so it flows together. It's kind of like water going down a channel. Now, of course, how do we calculate this? Well, we already cut our terms for our shear flow. And if we're looking at the flange right here, what we see is that this is going to be a maximum for B over 2 which makes sense. When we reach the middle, that's a maximum. So when our max shear flow in the flange, it's simply going to be equal to this. I won't bother reading it out. It is just plugging B over 2 into this equation. For what we have a very similar equation, and the starting shear flow is going to be the twice the max shear flow in the flange. Because what I said earlier, both of these shear flows have to come together. They come together and they go down the web like a channel. Because all of that shear flow is going to be transferred to the web regardless of sign. So that's our two from earlier, plus this new one that we've had calculating. And what we see right here is that that's going to be at a maximum when y is equal to zero, when y was measured from the centroid. Why is it not measured from the bottom here? Why is it measured from the centroid? And so that'll be a parabolic function of y, and it's going to be a max when it's zero. So we plug in zero for y, and we get the max shear flow in our web is going to be equal to twice the max shear flow in our flange plus this term. Okay, now so far, hopefully this is all making sense, going fairly well. But what about a closed section like this? Where's our free end? Where does it start? Well, they're a little bit more difficult to analyze. Um, however, we can figure it out. Because one way we have to think about this is to look at that longitudinal plane of symmetry. Like this is symmetric, and that symmetry matters. Also, we want the plane of symmetry because there's obviously two of them, but you want the one that's in line with the shear force. Well, if we cut it along that plane, what we'll see is that, yes, we have like two sections. And obviously, at some point, this has to be zero. It can't just swirl around forever and increase the shear flow to infinity. Um, no, at that longitudinal plane of symmetry, um, we have to have zero shear flow. We have to have zero shear flow at that point because it's perpendicular to the shear force. Now, yes, it does increase as it goes away from here. Um, but the big thing is that this is the longitudinal plane of symmetry. It's in line with my shear force. And at that point, if 
if we were to divide it, we would have to have zero shear stress right there. And so if we're looking at either one of these, well, they have the same exact profile for the shear flow. It increases, increases, increases until it gets to here, and then it decreases all the way back down again. Oh, well, I'll leave shear centers for next time, but thank you for listening, and I'll see you all later. Have an absolutely wonderful day. Bye-bye.